Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Theology Thursday 2.0. In today's episode, I want to talk about something uh, that is both controversial, but also hotly debated. Um, and it is something that a lot of young believers like to uh, kind of talk about, dive into, um, investigate, and that's the afterlife. Uh, specifically looking at uh, hell, the biblical version of hell, and, and what does scripture talk about when it comes to uh, what happens to unrepentant believers or, or unrepentant uh, non-believers. I mean, you can't necessarily be repentant and a non-believer, that just doesn't really work. But we're going to be talking about hell today and, and what we can see in scripture. And before I, I start to unpack this episode, I want to put a very big asterisk and a very big preface at the very, very beginning. It's that I'm not an expert in this. Um, I have spent some extensive time researching it personally, uh, also some extensive uh, time researching it back when I was in seminary getting my master's degree in theological studies. Uh, and I've read commentaries on it, I've read articles on it, and you know, I've kind of gone to God in my own prayer time about certain scripture, and so I am by no means an expert, and I encourage you to do your own research in this, and I encourage you to seek the Lord on your own about this. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm not really going to be looking spe at any specific scripture as the prime example of what hell is. More, I'm just going to read a set of verses that... Uh, kind of are an example of the various other times that the Bible, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, talk about uh, some sort of constructs of hell. So I want you to go ahead and grab your Bible, all right? Open up to the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book in the New Testament, and I want you to find chapter 13. We're going to read verses 49 through 50. Uh, so it's Matthew chapter 13, verses 49 through 50. Listen to God's word. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is just one example of many, many verses within the New Testament uh, where we get kind of a look, a glimpse at some sort of fiery torment, some sort of fiery hell, some sort of uh, painful afterlife for living a, a wicked life. Uh, this is Jesus talking specifically, um, and there are other mentions of it. There are other stories and parables that he uses. Uh, other ways to describe it, uh, such as, you know, chopping off dead branches and throwing them into the fire and, um, and, and various scripture that describes some sort of fire or the lake of fire, the, the pit of fire, the pit of hell. There, again, there's all sorts of verses that talk about it. But I want to kind of shed some light on where hell came from and where we kind of get our modern understanding of what hell looks like. So shortly after the church kind of finalized itself and, and really established itself uh, over in the Middle East plus uh, Europe, a lot of people started to do their own investigation into scripture. A lot of priests, a lot of monks, a lot of different uh, intellectual individuals started to really dive into scripture uh, to unpack the truth of God's Word. And as knowledge was starting to be shared and as people were starting to express their opinions and teach other individuals about what Scripture says, this would eventually reach the ears of artists and poets and sculptors and all sorts of people within the artistic world. There's one person in particular, um, a poet, who uh, wrote this thing called the Divine Comedy in, in Dante's Inferno. And, and he goes about talking about, uh, I think it's the seven levels of hell. Uh, and that's kind of some of the original foundation of this idea that there is a, a place down below under our feet that is 
this fiery torment where there are demons and the devil and and they torture you and torment you and and they force you to face your sins that you lived in your life and and it's just this eternity of pain and over the the years over the the countless generations that has been reimagined and transformed and fit to to match the the feelings of the community that's looking at it and then you get into the the western church the american church and and with the advent of the radio and the advent of of movies and and tv all of a sudden we start to get visual depictions not just words or maybe a painting but we actually get moving visual depictions of what we kind of interpret as hell and and that's where we get this idea of uh of a devil with horns and is red and has a tail and a pitchfork and and you know this underworld where where they're tormenting people and and murderers and rapists and criminals all go there and and they're you know just tortured for their sins but all of that does not line up with with scripture it does not line up with god's word and i know that's incredibly controversial and, and it's a very as i said earlier a hotly debated topic because there are whole denominations that base their entire theology on the idea of of torture and torment and and sinners suffering the consequences of their lives but when you actually look at the original language and you look at the context to which scripture was written things start to change and we start to gain a, a different understanding of what the afterlife looks like so first and foremost and this may shock many of you the Bible, um, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, really was not written for you and I. It was not written for, for an American reader or the Western church or people who live in, in 2020. Uh, the Old Testament is primarily uh, written as a way to archive the oral tradition of the Hebrew people. It was a way for them to constantly be reminded of their history and of their heritage. Uh, it was a way to be reminded that they are God's chosen people. Uh, and it really was not meant for Gentiles, which are non-Jews. Um, and then the Old Testament, again, it was really written for those living in that time period, uh, especially after the Gospels. Uh, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything after that, those are letters. Uh, these are letters written by the apostles to a very specific group of people in a very specific time period. Um, now, I don't want that to damage your faith or to hurt your, your understanding of scripture because I do want to clarify all of that. Even though it was at the time not written for you and I, because God is so smart, and because God is so capable of doing things way beyond the scope of time, He created it so that it could be universal. That it could literally apply to any time period. It is not bound by the time that we understand. You and I, we look at time as, as this straight line. Yesterday happened, it's in our past. We're right now in the current watching this video, whether it's right now for you or it's tomorrow, it doesn't really matter. But tomorrow is the future. We don't know what tomorrow holds. For God, that's not the case. He sees the past, present, and future simultaneously. So the Bible, even though not written directly for us, applies to us because it is God's infinite word that is outside of the scope of time. Now, with that said, um, this helps us to kind of unpack and understand the language that is used. English Bibles, and, and really honestly, any translation outside of the original language fails to truly encapsulate what the original speaker was trying to say. Um, ancient Aramaic and Hebraic, and even ancient Greek, doesn't necessarily translate very well into modern languages. First off, we have a far grander grasp of language than they did back then. Um, so that changes things. But also, there are uh, cultural ideas that no longer exist. 
now that did exist when this stuff was written. Um, and so, for example, uh, at the end of verse 50, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's actually referenced to Gehenna, uh, which is an actual physical location outside of Jerusalem. It was a, a location outside of the city walls of, of first century Jerusalem. Uh, this is where uh, Israel would, or, or Jerusalem would take all of their garbage, their refuse, uh, and they would burn it. Uh, they didn't have landfills or recycling plants back then. Uh, so they would take it out, put in a big old pile, and they would burn it. But not only would they burn all of their garbage, their waste, and, and all the stuff that you and I, you know, put in our garbage can, um, it was also where untouchables and the sick and the poor lived. Uh, and the reason why this is a specific location that is mentioned this way is that when you burn trash or when you burn you know, waste and excrement and, and fecal matter and stuff, that stuff stinks. That's really toxic and it smells really bad. It is not a place that you wanna live. It is not a place you want to visit. It is not a place you wanna be around. And then you combine people who are sick with leprosy, who are sick with plagues, who um, you know, are considered to be uh, undesirables or lower class citizens. That is not a place that any decent living person in their time wants to be in. And so this is a great way to kind of describe what it's like to be eternally separated from God. Because in first century Israel, their understanding of the afterlife was very different than our understanding. We have two places. In America, this is our understanding. We have two places. You have heaven above and you have hell below. In Israel, and in ancient Israel, that is not the case. And even today, it, it, for many devout Jews and for many rabbis, their understanding of the afterlife is very different than American understanding. And in Jesus' time, they understood that there were levels to the afterlife. Um, there was, uh, there's a place called Sheol, uh, which is translated by the Greeks into Hades, which is translated into uh, English as hell, but Sheol is not hell as you and I understand it. Sheol is what is called the abode of the dead or the house of the dead. And the best way to translate that for the modern Greek or the modern reader of the time that this was written, Hades was the closest thing that they could understand. And for them in Greek mythology, Hades is the abode of the dead. It's the waiting room for judgment. You just go and you sit. That's, that's it. There's nothing to it. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no happiness. There's no brightness. It, it's literally just you sit. That's it. You just sit and wait. But over the years, as I was alluding to earlier, we've kind of translated that and changed that and warped that into a, an understanding that Hades is hell. It is a place of torment, and that's not the case. But the same thing even applies to heaven. Um, in ancient Israel, and you see this actually at the end of Jesus' life when he's on the cross, the kingdom of God, um, or heaven, that was a place reserved only for God. God and his heavenly host. You and I, we don't go to heaven. Not in first century Israel's mindset. What we do go to is paradise. Their understanding is that uh, paradise is, is what Eden, the Garden of Eden, used to be. And so for us, we get to go to paradise if we live a righteous life, if we are repentant and we follow God's commandments, then we get to spend eternity in paradise. And then God will come down from his kingdom, come down from his throne, and he will walk the garden, he will walk paradise with us. And you see this when Jesus is on the cross and he's talking to the criminal who is asking for forgiveness, who's saying, I'm a criminal, I deserve death, but you are righteous, you don't deserve this. Will you remember me when you enter your, into your kingdom? And Jesus says, yes, today I promise you, you will be with me in paradise. He does not say you will be with me in heaven. He does not say you will be with me in the kingdom of God. He says paradise, and, and there's a reason why he says that, because that is where people who repent go. 
Now, if you're, you're not a believer and you're unrepentant, you go to Sheol, the abode of the dead, the grave, just a place you just sit and wait. And that's kind of where a lot of this gets mixed up and changed, um, is that we have this very large misunderstanding of what the afterlife looks like. Now, truth is, only Jesus knows what the, what the afterlife looks like because he came from the afterlife. He came from that world. He came from the side of the Father, from his right hand. He came from paradise, from God's kingdom, from heaven. So he had an understanding of what that was. But you and I, we don't. We don't really know what it looks like. We don't really know what the afterlife holds. Um, we don't really know if some denominations and some churches are right, that there is this big fiery pit of hell where the devil lives and he torments you for your sins. Um, or if there's this, this bright light in the sky and this heavenly realm where there are these cherubims, these fat little baby angels. Um, we don't really know what any of this stuff really looks like because along with um, misunderstanding scripture, there's also a lot of imagery that is used. There is a lot of things that are used to kind of describe the indescribable. So for example, you know, the idea of burning in fire uh, comes from the fact that we know what it feels like to get burned. Most of us have been burned at one time or another, and we know the pain of that. And the best way to understand eternal separation from God, where we are no longer in His presence, is that it feels like that. It's not necessarily what's happening, or maybe, I don't really know because I've never been there, I've never experienced that, but the best way for us to understand it is the sensation of burning. That's how painful it is. That's how difficult it is to, to be without God. And so what I want to encourage you guys, as, as you read your Bible, as, as you look at people who, who commit sins against you, or even about the sins that you commit in your own life, and you're petrified that you might go to hell, that the devil's waiting for you to torture you, to hurt you, to attack you, to rip your flesh from your bones, I want you to go to scripture first. I want you to read God's word and then I want you to pray about it. Ask God, clarify this for me. God, I'm in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. I'm gonna read verses 49 through 50. Can you please, Father, explain that to me? Share with me what I need to know. What does that mean? What are you trying to say? All right, because God will answer you. He wants to answer these questions for you. God doesn't really care to answer your prayer. God, I, I just really could use a car. You know, I just got my driver's license. Can you, you know, can you give me $30,000? There's this, I, there's this Toyota Tundra that I really, really like. It's, it's lifted up, like it would be perfect. It would get me through college. Can you give me $30,000 to buy this truck? God's not going to answer that prayer. But when you ask him about his word, he will answer you. He will tell you, this is what I mean. This is what I'm trying to tell you. All right, so, so I encourage you, please do your own research. Read scripture, go to God. Read commentaries, come up here to this church. We've got a library full of commentaries that you can read from people who spend their entire adult professional life studying this. This is all they do is study scripture and, and how the ancients understood things. And, and so I encourage you, do your research, pray, read scripture, spend time with God so that he can kind of help you better understand these very complex ideas. Guys, I love you very, very much. I do miss you. Uh, we had a great night last night uh, with the live stream for youth group. Uh, we played The Sims. We created our character, uh, Corey Hackenthorn, I think is her name. And uh, it's going to be kind of a long-term game we're going to play on our live streams. Uh, well, when we do uh, online only. When we're in person, we're not going to play Sims. But it was a lot of fun. Uh, I encourage you to join us next Wednesday at 6 o'clock here on YouTube for our Wednesday night's youth worship. Um, we are meeting as a leadership team next Wednesday afternoon to discuss when the church is going to open back up and when we are going to meet in person for Sunday morning worship and for Wednesday night youth group worship. Um, so stay tuned for that. You know, stay tuned to social media to know what's going on uh, within the youth group. 
and uh, you know what to do. There's a big red button down below, a big subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button for us uh, so that we can continue to grow and more people can see this stuff. Hit the like button for us so that uh, YouTube sees that people like this content and we'll push it forward. Uh, and share this with your friends. I know that a lot of your classmates have, have a lot of questions about the Bible and about God, and this is the best way that they can get their answers from, for their questions. But other than that, guys, I love you very much. I miss you, and I will see you next week. Bye.